Good afternoon. Today we are in conversation with Dr. Gloria Alexander, an HIV specialist from India and founder director of ASHA Foundation. ASHA being an acronym for Action, Service and Hope for AIDS. And this foundation works for the care and support of people living with HIV. Uh, Dr. Gloria Alexander is a recipient of India's prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy Award from the President of India for her outstanding services in the field of socio-medical relief. And for us Indians, it is indeed a matter of pride that she's also on the organizing committee of this year's International AIDS Conference, which is due to take place in Montreal, Canada from July 29 to August 2. Welcome to Dr. Gloria Alexander. Uh, Thank you so much, Shoma. <laughs> Gloria, what inspired you to devote your life to fighting AIDS and caring for people living with HIV? And what led you to establish ASHA Foundation? Well, actually, um, I completed my MD in medicine from CMC Vello in 1986. And 1987, I came to the Bangalore Baptist Hospital and I was working there as a consultant physician. And one day when I was off for the weekend, I came back on a Monday to work and I was doing rounds and I found that this new patient had been admitted uh, in the semi-private room. And he was a foreigner and an American. And when I went and examined him, he was quite sick. And uh, I finished examining him and I was quite perplexed as to what the diagnosis on this particular patient was. He definitely had a respiratory problem and he was quite I asked for him to be shifted to the ICU. And as I was leaving the room, he just asked me, uh, doctor, do you think I have AIDS? And I was like shocked because this was 1987. And at that time, AIDS was in our syllabus, even for MD, MD medicine. So I was quite unsure on how to respond to this. So I said, uh, what makes you think that you could have AIDS? And he said, no, doctor, I just asked. Uh, I, I actually got tested for it and it was negative. So I said, okay. And I left the room. Uh, arrangements were made to transfer him to the ICU, start him on oxygen and all the necessary things that needed to be done. And I went to the library and read up on AIDS and discovered that this patient was actually suffering from a very common opportunistic infection in people who are infected with HIV called PCP. So we started him on treatment for that. At that time, there was no uh, HIV testing available in the state of Karnataka. So I drew his blood and I sent it to CMC Velo. And we lost the patient in 36 hours after my first interaction with him, he died. And um, uh, about a week after his death, we got the report from CMC was HIV positive. And as his body lay in the mortuary, there was nobody who came to collect his body. Later on, I discovered that this was an unmarried male from San Francisco, and he knew that he was HIV positive. And because of the stigma that he was facing in the USA, not only because he was HIV positive, but because he was also a homosexual, he came to India to the in Puttaparthi and uh, wanted to spend his last days there. And then when he became sick, the others at Puttaparthi brought him to Baptist and left him. So he died actually a very lonely uh, death, painful death, all alone, so far away from his family and friends. Nobody came to claim his body after his death. And we actually had to, you know, make arrangements to see his body was cremated. And so uh, for me, it was, uh, it had an impact on me because I thought, what manner of disease is this that makes a man leave his family, his friends, his country and come and die only dead so far away. So it had some kind of an impact on me. 
around that time, I also had an opportunity to do a awareness program for 250 people on HIV AIDS. So I did that. And at the end of it, I had about 30 questions, all very curious to know about HIV. And slowly, we also started seeing our first two, three you know, patients in India, in Mumbai, in Chennai, HIV positive women were being diagnosed. And then um, uh, all this put together, uh, Africa was, you know, incredibly from the impact of this infection, their middle generation, large numbers of their middle generation died and there were grandparents left to look after children or they were child-headed households. So everybody was talking about how, how India, because of its high population, is likely to be the next flashpoint for HIV. And I had always wanted to do a little bit of social service after I retired from medicine, but I thought, why wait till I retire? Oh, why not now? And therefore, I made the decision to do my you know, two bits and uh, uh, resigned from my full-time job at Baptist Hospital and start Asha Foundation. And the first project, there were two projects that we started out with. One was the AIDS helpline because there was so much of curiosity about HIV. At the same time, people wanted, and therefore we started this AIDS helpline. And the second was starting a clinic for HIV positive patients. But now we have expanded and we have adolescent health education. We have Camp Rainbow for HIV positive children. Um, we have care and support civil services for uh, families and people infected with HIV. We also have prevention of mother to child transmission. Of so these are some of the projects that we uh, work with uh, currently at Asha Foundation. Sorry for that long answer. <laughs> no, no, no. But that's so important that I think that that has formed the basis of what you are today and what you are doing for uh, others today in distress. And uh, you have brought up a very good point of uh, uh, taking into your services prevention of mother to child transmission. So why do you think it is important to focus on women and children when it comes to HIV care and control? And why is prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV an essential cog in the wheel to achieve the UNAIDS goal of 95, 95, 95, and eventually to end AIDS? So if you look at uh, uh, women today in India are a vulnerable group as far as HIV is concerned. Now, it's also important to remember that out of the uh, global population of people living with HIV, 53% constitute women. So women are the majority living with HIV in the world. And if you look at India, every year, the number of women getting infected is increasing. And today, women constitute about 44% infected with HIV. When we look at India, we have a slightly peculiar situation when you look at India with regard to HIV in women. There are actually two categories of women. One category is the key population of women, like women who are in sex work and who get infected uh, with HIV. And we are able to reach out to them, test them periodically and treat them. This group constitutes the majority of women in India living with HIV, and that's about 90% of women infected with HIV in India are housewives. And these are women who are infected mostly from their husbands. They, in a sense, don't really practice sexual uh, risk. And uh, many of them have the only partner are their husbands, and yet they are getting infected. And uh, these women, when they get pregnant, they infect their children. So one of the reasons for women being an important cog in the wheel to treat and prevent infection among them is the fact that slowly we are seeing increasing numbers. 
These are women who don't perceive themselves to be at risk of HIV infection. These are women who get pregnant and when they get pregnant, they infect and therefore children who are HIV positive live the rest of their lives with an illness. So it's very important for us to be able to uh, diagnose these women early because they won't come by themselves to be tested. Women don't perceive themselves to be at risk. Women are caregivers. So they are the last to come to a clinic for care. So uh, in pregnancy, because uh, women do come for at least one checkup during their pregnancy, and it's a good time to do the HIV test and find out uh, if they are positive. The other important thing is that it's a, you know, once you diagnose that a woman is HIV positive, you can put her on treatment, and this treatment will prevent the risk of transmission to the child during the mother's pregnancy. And then you continue that treatment during the pregnancy, labor, delivery, postpartum period, and throughout life for that woman so that she is alive and well to look after her child. And so with treatment, with BMTCT, we are able to bring down the risk of transmission from about 40-45% in the breastfeeding population to less than 5%. And in women who don't breastfeed, which is uh, in developed countries, the risk of transmission is actually reduced to less than. And if a woman is already on ART and she becomes pregnant, the risk of transmission is less than 1%. In fact, it's 0.1%. So all these things are important for us to be able to diagnose women and treat them. One, because they are a hidden population that we have to find out and treat too, because you can, by treating them, you can prevent transmission to children. And three, there are gender-based differences in the way men and women respond to HIV infection. Uh, in women, actually, they're more prone to non-AIDS comorbidities like uh, cardiovascular events, as well as cerebrovascular events they respond in a different way to antiretroviral therapy. We worry about their bone health and um, the fact that they're more likely to get cancer of the cervix if there is an increased incidence in women who are HIV positive. And um, so, you know, it's important to diagnose these women, to treat them, because once you treat them early, they can have a normal lifespan, a normal health, uh, ahead of them. And uh, it's important that women and children need to be diagnosed and treated early for these reasons. And it's a very important cog in the wheel in the management of HIV infection. Where are we in India in terms of achieving elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV? And what are the barriers to eliminating this uh, mother to child transmission in India? even when highly effective treatment regimens are there, they are available to us. So can you just share some statistics and also the barriers? So I have to remember that in India, every year, 27 million women get pregnant. And that is as high as the population of a small country. And hidden among these 27 million people are about 20,500 women who are HIV positive. So it's a very difficult job to be able to trace all these 27 million people and test them for HIV is one of the barriers. Large numbers of pregnant women and finding the HIV positive women among that group. Uh, even according to the annual report of 2021 of the National AIDS Control Organization, um, and that was, you know, they had statistics available till about September 2020, and they were able to test about 15.7 million women for HIV, and of these, about 9,000 were, and 91% of those were treated. So it's important to get these women, find these women and treat them. So that is one of the biggest barriers I feel, finding the women who are HIV positive, because even today 
we have many women in the rural areas who will not come to a hospital, uh, even for an antenatal checkup, though that is slowly improving over the years. And if you look at India, we have criteria for elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV. There are, I think, about 14 countries in the world who've been uh, validated by World Health Organization for elimination of mother to child transmission. These are smaller countries where already the primary healthcare system is so good that they were able to achieve uh, uh, elimination. In India, they, I think about six, uh, phase one of elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV. And in 13 states, uh, assessment is going on for how far they have reached with regard to elimination of mother to child. So I would say that we are making progress and uh, you know we are, uh, the government is taking this very seriously. We are making progress and I hope that we will be able to achieve this uh, in the next few years. Yeah, all force to that and uh, for that, uh, that, that positive hope which Asha yes. is providing and, and <laughs> which you are providing us today. And uh, here I am, uh, I would like uh, your take on the recent anti-abortion ruling which was given by the uh, Supreme Court of USA. How is it going to impact HIV care and control? And uh, could be other, there could be repercussions in other countries as well. Uh, well, I really would not like to make any comments on this. It's a highly controversial topic. There are positive points, there are negative points, everybody is talking about. And um, what is the kind of impact it would have? Today in India, uh, you know, it's the desire of many women and especially HIV positive women to want to have children. And we have found, I mean, the antiretroviral therapy, the way we do it in India, uh, at least in the small cohort of patients that I have, um, we have started them on ART um, in pregnancy, and uh, they have been able to prevent for the last three years haven't had a positive child in our pregnant women. And I'm talking about, you know, from, we, we are doing a study on this and in about 280 women that we are following up uh, in pregnancy over the last few years, we haven't had a single positive child. So I think that abortion is a completely individual decision that has to be made by a woman for, her own personal uh, decision because we don't know what's the type of situation in which she is living and in which uh, she has to make the decision for herself. And I think that is important. And I also feel that in India, a lot of women who were HIV positive were being false, falsely advised to have an abortion because they were being told that your child will be born HIV positive. Even today it's happening. Even as recently as last year, one of our HIV positive patients who wanted to have that child so badly was advised abortion. But now we are seeing that ART is so effective that if a child, woman really wants to have a child, then we should encourage her and support her and help her so that she can have a HIV negative child. And yeah. uh, so I think about, you know, specific personalized decision and each woman is, you know, uh, has to make that decision for herself. Yeah, you're very right that she, a woman should have right over her bodily autonomy. Absolutely. And she should be the one to decide and make the correct choice. Very true, very true. Uh, Glory, what can we do more and in a better way to follow the science, as goes the theme of AIDS 2022. It says re-engage and follow the science. Yeah, the theme of the AIDS 22 uh, conference is re-engage and follow the science. The term re-engage came in because, you know, for 40 years, uh, 
Delhi was holding the top place as far as pandemics went. And then in 2019, December, COVID came along and removed, pushed HIV away and uh, became the topmost epidemic in the world and pandemic uh, in the world. And both HIV and COVID-19, there are lots of myths and misconceptions about both these infections. And it's very important to know that it is science which helps us to get rid of these myths and misconceptions. And that by following the signs, you're proving that here, see, this is something which is effective in the treatment, in the management, in the life, normal life with HIV and, uh, or even with COVID and to follow the signs accordingly. So, you know, when we looked at, at uh, even elimination of mother to child, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV, we looked at a single drug and then we found that, you know, two drugs are better than one drug. And then we found that three drugs are better. And today it's three drugs which do the job. And now we're looking at two drugs again after two decades of treatment with three drugs. And we're looking at injectables. We are looking at undetectable is equal to untransmissible. And all of this is possible only because of science. You know, it's because of studies which have been done in a very scientific manner in a very unbiased manner with controls where you can say that, yes, this has proved to be useful. And uh, today we are in the absence of, uh, of a vaccine for HIV infection, in the absence of a permanent cure for HIV vaccine, uh, 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 infection, we are dependent on science in other areas to help us to overcome this infection. So. Yes, and now we are talking about even PrEP, of course, uh, not taken off in a big way in India, but PrEP is another, you know, proven way of prevention of infection. And we know that in India, if people take treatment and you're undetectable, you can't transmit. So in a way, treatment is prevention for us too. So all these things are proved only because of scientific studies that have been done. Very true. And science has taken giant leaps uh, in this direction. But uh, yes, it is important that scientific uh, discoveries translate into public health gains. And yes, there absolutely. should not be whether there should not be so much of a time. Like sometimes I know that there could be problems, but I think it is important to reduce that time lag between uh, making them available for public health gains. So anything else Always. you would like to share? Yes, sorry. Anything else you would like to share? Um, yeah, the or hope anything? that, yes. you know, is something that has been uh, today. Today we look at HIV infection as a chronic manageable illness. This has been transformed from a fatal life-threatening illness to a chronic manageable illness. And the only reason for that is the advent of ART, antiretroviral therapy. And the reason for ART coming into the picture is because of scientific studies and because of science. Yes, there has always been a delay in, um, you know, I mean, it's not just, there's such a big time lag between what is available in the developed countries and what is available in Indian countries. You know, um, uh, these are two things that I want to say. One, about how HIV has been transformed into a chronic manageable illness. And uh, today we look at it just like diabetes or high blood pressure, and we talk to our patients, help them feel. I also feel that stigma and discrimination has reduced to some extent. There is more of self-stigma really, rather than stigma from others towards people who are HIV positive. And the third thing that I would like to say is the contribution that India has made towards, uh, you know, we, we contribute towards 92% of the world's requirement for ART is manufactured in India and provided. And I think that is something that we need to be very proud of because most of the countries which, are, which consider HIV to be a major problem are in the global south. And India is able to contribute uh, it's ART at very affordable rates 
to all these countries. So the two things that today it's a chronic manageable illness and two that we contribute in a big way to the world's requirement of ART is something extra that I would like to yeah. Many thanks to Dr. Gloria Alexander for this very insightful and inspiring conversation. Friends, we were listening to Dr. Gloria Alexander, NHIV specialist from India, who has devoted her entire life to improve the lives of people living with HIV. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shobha.